When Barbara asked me, I was going to be in the States for another event in New York, and when we were talking about my coming here, I said, Barbara, you know, unless I'm killed after my speech, I don't know too much about martyrdom. And so, um, <laughs> so, uh, and she said, well, no, you know what, the topic of your choice. And um, I, I've chosen to speak about young people because I just had the most extraordinary experience this summer. I'm young at heart, and I went to World Youth Day in Madrid. It was one of the most exhilarating, tiring, happy, exciting, inspiring, uplifting experiences of my life. Not my first World Youth Day, but um, EWTN had a whole crew there, obviously, covering. We had the Friars and Life on the Rock, and, and we had a whole crew there for a long time. And I did a blog and my radio shows and everything. But um, those nine, I've always loved young people, and I taught French for many years, and I have nieces and nephews, and just, we all know, being around, if you're young, it's great, and being around young people, and even, you know, little ones, nieces and nephews who now have kids. Um, it's just wonderful, and it is uplifting and inspiring. And I have to say that what I saw and felt and heard in, in Madrid um, was the new living church, in the sense of I remember saying to one young person, you know, you're the future of the church. And he was an Australian young man, and he said, no, we're, we're the present. And I said, of course you're right. Um, but I, 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 this Benedict generation, the, the younger people growing up for whom Benedict has in, in their teen and maybe early 20 years, th this is the man under whom they, they are growing up um, in church. And, and the joy that these young kids had, of course it was the joy of being with each other, but you watched, if you watch the focus of their life every single day, their focus was the liturgy. Adoration, you cannot even begin to fathom the hours that these young people had. They didn't sit around piazzas in Madrid. Sure, they were there for a while. They spent far more hours in adoration. And if they could find an adoration chapel and it wasn't even their language, they went. And th they were joyful in their faith. They're very firm in their faith. And uh, mass attendance was, uh, you know, don't even think about not going to daily mass. Even if you had a 20-minute walk to your bus that would take you on a 20-minute ride to get the 40-minute subway ride in, into Madrid, because a lot of these kids lived um, pretty far out. So, but, but to watch them live their faith and their friendship, and they were all there because of the faith. It was World Youth Day, it was the Holy Father, and um, the, I, I saw joy in the subways, I saw, uh, not joy isn't maybe the proper word, maybe it is, it, Eucharistic adoration, um, confession. There were 17,000 priests at World Youth Day, 2,000 2, of them heard confession, some for hours and hours um, on end in Retiro Park. They, they had several hundred confessionals set up. Um, you, you may have heard or read, of course, that the Knights of Columbus and the Sisters of Life, they had a great big center in the sports center in Madrid um, for English language pilgrims. It was beautifully organized. Um, maybe one of the better organized sites um, of the whole World Youth Day. But a million and a half people, there's bound to be some some snafus, but um, of World Youth Day, for example, one young friend of mine wrote me, um, he recently ordained a, a deacon, he said, what could have better expressed the exuberation of one and a half million young hearts and one 84-year-old heart than apocalyptic lightning, torrents, and roaring winds, if you saw the Saturday vigil of World Youth Day on TV, you know, I mean, the heavens were rent asunder, torns, uh, um, tents were torn down. As a matter of fact, unfortunately, there were 30 Eucharistic chapels around the ring of, of where these 1.5 million people were, and a number of them, which did contain the hosts um, that were gonna be used for mass the next day, were, uh, ended up soaked. Of course, they'd not been consecrated yet, but Anyway, th this young man got it right, and he said, El Papa sat peacefully, his white locks blowing, undaunted, as he remained throughout these six years of various storms, firm in the faith. So this young man is describing the Pope, and that's exactly what I saw in the young people. And you know, these young people were there, and they did a heck of a lot of socializing, but not the network. I don't think I saw three cell phones. 
in the entire time I was there, in the squares, in the restaurants, in the, in the centers, like the um, love and, and life center of the Knights. And um, their, their socializing was, it was talking, it was walking in, in small groups, in large groups. It was kids giving hugs to each other, uh, unabashed, you know, uh, signs uh, of affection. But not two people walking down the street and each of them is, is on their cell phone. Um, so the young people of Madrid, they shared this, they had this atmosphere of fun and enthusiasm and sharing and inquisitiveness because this was the universal church getting together. And that's what the kids told me. I, I fortunately am able to speak quite a number of languages and I would go to all the different groups and ask them why they were here in Madrid. You spent a lot of time and money to get here and not all the living uh, you know, situations for a million and a half young people would be, should we say, ideal. And they had come to meet their brothers and sisters in the Universal Church. And they discovered that there was, and we've heard this said today, they have discovered that there are kids out there who really have to sacrifice, who have to be very courageous to practice their faith. You know, we're sitting here and there's no problem. We can come and go to Mass tomorrow and we have this total freedom um, to, to practice our faith and, and wear a cross and so forth. And there are many parts of the world that the young kids from the West, from Europe, learned that people cannot practice their faith. So people were here to see um, their shepherd. They were here to see the Pope, here. They were in Madrid um, to see the Pope and, and the Universal Church in, of course, the person of the Pope. And one French um, young scout in his group was in Madrid, and he said, we're here to be strengthened by our peers to learn from them, especially from those who live in difficult circumstances. And he said, sometimes we take our faith and the fact we can freely practice it for granted and, and I'm sure we do. Just, you know what? Think of it the next time you walk into this church for Mass. Just remember how free you are to do that. And um, one young man from Dublin impressed me, and I'll get back to, to him in a minute. But um, I, I am talking, when I talk about the Benedict generation, I am talking about very special young people, the people I've met in Madrid. But I met them today. The, the, the young people to whom I spoke um, or earlier this afternoon, and I've met many others in many countries. But I also want you to know that I do know that there's a Benedict generation in the sense of young people growing up with uh, Benedict, who, who's the Pope. They do not have what these young people do. Um, they don't have the joy, the enthusiasm for life, the knowledge of Jesus and, and the knowledge of faith. I know that there are uh, youth who are lost. They're wandering and they're wondering. <clears throat> Excuse me. And they're unsure of their future, unsure, is there, can there really be a God in, in, in the world? Look at the TV, the violence, the, the wars, and, and men killing you know, their own citizens in countries like Syria and so forth. So um, there are a lot of people out there that don't know. We have to be there for them. But um, going back to the Benedict generation, should we say, of Madrid, they're the, the, the Benedict generation, the new Bee Gees, for anybody who is out there that knew the old Bee Gees. Um, anyway, but what they, what they have and can give us and, and what they are, um, can offer to their peers, but also what we have and can give them. And we do have a firmness in, in the faith. I believe that's certainly why you're here today. Um, do we sometimes always have joy? I don't know. But the kids that I talked to in, in Spain came from a huge variety of backgrounds. Uh, many huge uh, sacrifices were made for the kids just to be in Madrid. Um, but it was uh, fun, as I said, to watch them intermingle. And what blew my mind as I'm going around talking to these kids, you'd say, who was your best friend? It wasn't Joe or Giovanni or Jean. Their best friend was Jesus. And th they were telling me wonderful stories, of course I don't have the time for that today, of, of what Jesus has meant for them in their lives singly and um, what he gives to them. He's a real person. I think it's easier for all of us to understand our faith because we've had Jesus on earth, thank the Lord, because I think God as a spiritual being, we have to be able to understand somebody who looks and feels like us, and, and, and that's what Jesus is for these people. They, they knew him. This is the Jesus who walked and talked 
and laughed and ate fish, um, you know, on the shores of Galilee. And he did it 2,000 years ago, but he's very much alive for, for these young people today. They're Christians because they're following Christ. And the interesting thing is, part of their joy came, how well do they know Jesus? I want you to think for a moment of an encounter you may have had five minutes ago, five years ago. Um, you went to an event, whatever, could have been in a store. You met a person who was like so remarkable, so wonderful, so maybe you ran out of adjectives. And y your first feeling is to go home and, or, or get on the phone or something and tell somebody else about this person. You know, oh, mom, I met the most amazing French teacher, whatever. Um, and, and, <laughs> and, and that's um, how, how these kids see Jesus. He, he's the reason for their being who they are. He's Jesus Christ. They're Christians. And um, they want to tell others about him. And, and we should be, have that same kind of, of spirit in our hearts, obviously. And you've heard this in a beautiful tapestry of talks today. You've heard this in many different ways from people. Um, and do we feel the same way? I think we should ask ourselves that question. Maybe less so because we have, as that one young man said, taken some things um, for granted. But think of Jesus. I mean, when did you last know someone that was so good, so loving, so caring, so forgiving, so willing to overlook our faults. You could do the most dastardly thing on earth and you're gonna be welcomed right back. We know the story of the prodigal son. So who, who wouldn't wanna know this person and tell everybody about him? And that's what the young people were doing. Now, um, the, they know Jesus and they want others to know. And their, this enthusiastic, untainted love that they have for Christ and for his church is one of their gifts for us. And another gift, and we've heard this word today too, is courage. Because you know what? It doesn't take courage not to do something. In other words, you know, not, not to be good. Sometimes it can take courage to stand out and do a favor for somebody and be good and speak up. And again, a theme that we've heard today. Um, it doesn't take courage not to do good, not to pray, not to follow rules, not to be a Christian. The real courage comes from having to do or trying to do um, all of those. I mentioned the young man from Madrid. I'll never forget this encounter as long as I live. Um, it was late at night and I was on a subway platform going back to my hotel. And um, there were five young men who came over and said, did I speak English? And yes, I did. And, and they wanted to know about a subway stop. And I only knew about the subway stop because it happened to be one beyond mine. And I said, yes, it's the same line. Let's get on together. And so um, we only had really minutes before my stop and then their stop. And I learned the five men were all from Dublin. And um, I asked why they had come to Madrid. And I was touched to the core by their answer. The young man seated next to me basically spoke for the others, and he said they were all good friends and they had come to Madrid to be strengthened in their faith. And he said, I'm sure you know about the situation of the church in Ireland with the sex abuse crisis, people leaving the church, and so on. He said, we love the church in our faith, but these are difficult times to be a Catholic in Ireland. In fact, he said, I often say I'm a Christian instead of saying I'm a Catholic. He said, we're in Madrid because we want to meet our peers, to be encouraged um, by them, to pray with them. We have to know others might have problems such as we do and how they deal with them and, and how they get strength to face up, to live out their Christian identity. And we have to pray for our own church. He, he spoke with enormous, I wouldn't have been surprised if I had tears in my eyes that night. Every time I, I reread this, I think of this young man, I can see his, his face, I can feel his heartbreak, I can feel um, his passion. And I told him that a good friend of mine, of course, is the Archbishop of Dublin, Dermot Martin. And I said, I've known, we had worked together at the Roman Curie, and we were both members of Vatican Holy See delegations to many conferences. And um, I know he has a very, very high regard. But I have to tell you, the absolute worst thing about that encounter was that the time passed so quickly, we're on a fast subway, all of a sudden it was my stop to get off. I really could have stayed on. I never thought about it, but it was late. Um, I forgot to ask this young man his name. I do remember saying I pray for him, and I, and I have prayed for him um, daily. And um, I've interviewed, I, I wish I had more time to bring you some of the stories, a young man from England 
He said he was from Joe, from Darby, near Nottingham. And he said, um, if you know Robin Hood, you know Nottingham. So um, why was Joe at World Youth Day? Because he could uh, profess his faith without being intimidated. And I said, you know, Pope um, Benedict calls you people the future of the church. And I asked Joe if he found that scary or challenging. And he said, standing up so straight, he said, no, that is a privilege. And I said, what do you want to bring back to the UK after this World Youth Day? He said, I want to bring back joy, which is one of the key ingredients in my life um, and what I find in the faith. He said, I want to bring back joy and that it is a privilege to profess the Catholic faith. And Joe and his friends, this group that came together, almost like the ones from Dublin, uh, they've made a pact upon their return to meet once a month to pray together and have a meal and talk about their faith. So you know what they're going to do? They're going to strengthen each other. And then when they go to work or university or whatever they're doing, they're going to have that um, renewed strength. And Pope Benedict's always talking to, to young kids. And it's amazing how these, these young kids do love the Holy Father. He could be, as John Paul could have been, you know, their grandfather. And they just love this man and what he represents, and he is the successor of Peter. But l listen to what Benedict challenged um, the young people to be. He said, dare to be glowing saints. Uh, frankly, if I stopped right there, I think there's nothing more beautiful. Dare to be glowing saints, in whose eyes and hearts the love of Christ beams, and who thus bring light to the world. And he said, Christ is not so much interested in how uh, often in your lives you stumble and fall, but how often you pick yourself up again. And, and then he talked about being saints and said the, nation, the notion is so distorted and people think of these very holy, pious beings. And again, we heard a lot of the notions of saints come up today. But he said, um, saints are very joyful people and they all, by the way, had problems. And... Pope Benedict told young people, Christ did not call them because they're good and perfect, but because Christ is good, and he wants to make you his friends. And you know, that applies to us as well. You are the light of the world because Jesus is your light. And he said, you're Christians because you do special, and um, not because, you do special and extraordinary things, but because Christ um, is in your life. And, and, and Pope Benedict is always laying down the gauntlet um, to all of us as Catholics. We're going to see it in the um, year of faith and in the Synod for Evangelization. But he is looking to the young and future church, or again, as that young man from Australia said, you know, we are uh, the present as well. And Pope Benedict said in the very first week of his pontificate to all of us, you were not made for comfort. You were made for greatness. Mm -hmm.